been praying about this message this week. We've been chasing wisdom. And Alexei mentioned just a moment ago about a garden. The passage is found in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to spend a few moments there this evening. So if you've got your Bibles, you're going to want to hang out. Genesis chapter 3. Because really, in a way, that's our origin story. The place where this whole mess began. I don't know about you, but we can learn a lot about our superheroes from their origin stories. And Hollywood can make a buck or two as we seek them out, right? But here we go. Genesis chapter 3. A familiar story. One that's challenging for me to present because it's something old. Something that you've heard year after year. You've grown up with this story. There's a serpent. There's a woman. There's a man, but there's a deeper meaning that we're going to experience tonight. So pause with me for a moment, one more moment as we seek God's presence here. Lord, thank you. God, we're chasing wisdom, and by doing that, we're chasing you. May you show up right here, right now, sit beside us, and may we learn from an ancient story that can be applied to our lives today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The year was 1938. You remember it. We were there, right? It was the year that aliens invaded the United States. Now, don't write me off too quick, okay? There's actual audio recording of this invasion. Yep, go visit your history professor this week and ask about this story. On a cool October evening, CBS interrupted its normal audio broadcast of evening weather and music with breaking news of a strange meteorite landing in Grover's Mill, New Jersey. A team of reporters was dispatched to report on the scene, and as the smoke settles, alien eyes peer back from a crashed UFO. Now you're running right over there, right? You're going to say hi. The police officers approach. Something weird is going on. And just about as they're, they're carrying their white truce flag toward this UFO, the aliens attack with their heat ray. America and freedom are under attack. And for the next 45 minutes, CBS continued to broadcast reports and developments of this alien invasion. All from a soundstage in New York City. You see, a local theater was on the verge of bankruptcy and collapse, and its producers were desperate to put themselves back on the map, desperate enough to dream up a realistic-sounding radio story adapted from the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The problem, they did such a good job, the broadcast sounded too realistic. The pacing, the plot, the actors, the sound design, all combined to make a significant number of Americans listening that night, the night before Halloween, believe that the eastern seaboard of the United States had been infiltrated by an invading army. Some believed it was aliens, others that Germany was the aggressor. Mind you, we're less than a year away from the beginning of World War II. Pandemonium broke loose on the streets. People interrupted prayer meetings and broadcasts to tell of this breaking news. All because there was enough truth in the story to make it all believable. And that's the unfortunate reality we live in today. Let's face it, we're all pretty gullible, aren't we? It's written on the ceiling. Don't check it. Don't check it. Our default is to believe something until proven wrong. You're innocent until proven guilty, right? Humanity is built around that framework that we see with our eyes and what we hear with our ears is true, not because it's proven to us, but simply because our senses have collected that information. And this human characteristic, which Professor Timothy Levine terms truth default theory, is exploited every single day in your life, minute by minute, second by second, especially in the rise of the information age where our economy is built less around money and more around ideas. We've seen the rise of widespread misinformation and deception in the past few years. Before the internet, 
untruths would rise and fall. We always start believing. We stop believing only when our doubts and misgivings rise to the point where we can no longer explain them away. But now, as a society, we feed off of them like cows with their heads in the feed trough. Social media corporations, news outlets, and marketers all exploit this tendency, but that's not the worst news yet. In our hunt for wisdom, in our pursuit for happiness, our enemy, the devil, exploits this weakness too. The devil's primary tactic to tempt you is not an overt appeal to do something completely against your morals. You're better than that, right? It's simply getting you to believe an illusion about reality. His weapon of choice? Ideas. Ideas that are grounded in reality so much so that we buy them wholesale without checking the ingredients first. There's just a small mark, slight tweak, small adjustment towards deception that born out in our lifetimes, it leaves us off track. The devil is a good liar, and he knows that the most effective lies are mostly true. And the next effective ones are true but not the whole truth. And this trait is so fundamental to the human experience that the Bible describes it in the very same situation in its opening pages. God creates a world. You know the story. He creates trees. He creates humanity and calls them all good. God gives the first human simple instructions. Every tree is available to you, especially the tree of life. But one tree is not. Which tree was that? The knowledge, tree of knowledge of good and evil. When we pick up the story, Genesis chapter 1, or Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, I should say. We'll put it up on the screen for you. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? There's a crafty serpent. Perhaps a wise serpent, the wisest of all God's creation. He's cunning, and it's the most wise He asked a simple, unassuming question. Did I get that right, that God didn't want you to eat from any tree of the garden? He's cunning, remember? He's wise enough to know to not attack God's word directly, but to play with Eve's understanding and interpretation of God's word. Her answer, Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. Of course we may eat from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. No, 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 no. We can't. We we, we can eat from all of them, but there's just that one, that one that's off limits. And God said that we shouldn't eat from it, and I'm going to add in there myself that we shouldn't even touch it. God said dying we will die or surely we'll die, but, you know, we'll we'll just die. You see, our perception often stands in place of God's reality. Eve had twisted her understanding of what God had instructed her to do. She got it mostly right, but her descriptions of God's word are just slightly off. God's instructions were simple. Don't eat. And the consequence, you will surely die. In a way, Eve ups the requirements given and lessens the punishment itself, and the devil pounces. He responds, In verses 4 through 5, you won't die. Don't worry about it, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. You're not going to die. Don't worry about it. Well, at least not right away. Death isn't something to be feared because, you see, God not that trustworthy. There's a knowledge he's holding back from you. God's not playing fairly here. He knows something that you should know, but he's not letting you in on it. Because if you knew the knowledge of God, well, you'd be like him. And don't you want to be like God, knowing good from evil? The serpent assured that they would become like God, but the sad irony was that they were already like God. They were created in his image. How quickly the first humans lost their sense of identity. The serpent's implication, God is keeping wisdom from Adam and Eve. Perhaps God was keeping wisdom for Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom in it that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. 
When God originally made trees in that garden, he made them good and pleasing to the eye. You can see that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God was the one that was seeing good and beautiful things and teaching Adam and Eve what it, was, what it meant to be good and to be pleasing. But now Eve has taken her sight into her own hands. I couldn't think of a better metaphor. I don't know how you take your sight into your hands, but you get it. Eve perceives that she can gain wisdom through something other than God. In a way, Eve is taking the place of God, and let me tell you tonight, that is dangerous ground. She deduced that by disobeying God, she would reach the fulfillment of the desire to be wise. Don't we all want to be wise? To know good and evil. What she didn't realize is that she already had the good that she could ever want. John Salehammer, in his commentary on Genesis, puts it this way. Man's disobedience is not so much depicted as an act of great wickedness or a great transgression, as much as it is an act of great folly. He and she had all the good they would ever need, but they wanted more. They wanted to be like God. Oftentimes, we want knowledge more than we want trust. We want to seek after something for our minds before we'll trust somebody in a relationship. You see, knowledge can be gained on my own. I can read a book. I can listen to a podcast. I can attend class sometimes. Wisdom requires relationship, and relationship requires trust. We want to experience the delight and wonder that knowledge brings without having the responsibility of guideposts and limits. We want to be free on our own. But often that freedom on our own makes us anxious and makes us fearful. Walter Brueggemann, commenting on Genesis, puts it this way. Anxiety comes from doubting God's providence, from rejecting his care and seeking to secure our own well-being. Failure to trust God with our lives is death. To trust God with our lives is to turn from the autonomous I to the covenanting thou from our invented well-being to God's overriding purposes and gifts. The allure of knowledge is that if I get to a place where I know enough, I can make decisions on my own. I'm in college now, right? I got this. Don't worry about it. But when I remove relationships from the equation, thinking that that will make life easier, it often ends up working the, the opposite. More knowledge should bring me more freedom, right? The sad reality is that we've bought the lie of modernism, that I can be an independent actor without accountability. The lie that I can make wise and good decisions on my own. I can have my own truth and you can have yours and and life will be okay. This was the original lie in the garden long ago. The same lie eroding our world, one thought, at a time. Nancy Pierce and Charles Colson put it this way in a book, How Now Shall We Live? All the ideologies, all the utopian promises that have marked this century have proven utterly bankrupt. Americans have achieved what modernism presented as life's greatest shining purpose, individual autonomy, the right to do what one chooses. Yet this has not produced the promised freedom. Instead, it has led to the loss of community and civility, to kids shooting kids in schoolyards, to citizens huddling in gated communities for protection. We have discovered that we cannot live with the chaos that inevitably inevitably results from choice divorced from morality. And how do we understand morality? How do we chase wisdom, or maybe put another way, the knowledge of good and evil? See, it boils down to relationship. It's community. By being dependent on someone other than ourselves to help us make wise decisions. I'd offer to you tonight that choice divorced from relationship will lead to ruin. The test at the tree is less about getting an exam right and more about getting to know God more. God placed the tree and gave the instructions not to be obstinate, but to extend an invitation. The tree of knowledge of good and evil stood as an invitation to take our question for understanding, our search for knowledge, our chase for wisdom to God instead of somewhere else, 
to wisdom herself, to trust that God knows and that God cares, that he has their best interest in mind, and in his time, he will unravel for us the mysteries of good and evil and walk with us every single step of the way. Adam and Eve, for a moment, thought that they could bypass God to access wisdom. That is very dangerous ground. Seeking good apart from God always leads to evil. That's why we're in the mess we're in. God wanted to be in relationship with the first humans. He fiercely desired that even after they foolishly chose something else, yes, there were consequences. But even in the curse given to the serpent and to our first parents, the hope of a Messiah sprung through. A someone, a seed who would make all things right as they were promised. Even though Adam and Eve broke their side of the relationship, God never broke his and leaned in even closer after the fall. So, that was a lot. How do we sum it all up? Adam and Eve were right in their chase for wisdom, for wanting to know more, but wrong in the direction that they took. They chose knowledge above relationship. They traded trust for certainty, and you simply cannot have both. As you chase wisdom, know this. You don't need to know everything when you're with someone you trust.